Hello soil lovers and farming secrets family. I'm just here in front of the Fairlight Butchers. They are the hosts of tonight's event. Uh, so I'm super excited. The event is just being held down the road at that uh, hall over there. And I uh, just had a good chat with the butcher who's been at this butcher for one year now, but the uptake on Biodynamics lamb and pork has been actually increasing tenfold. Uh, most weeks they're running out of stuff to produce, to, to stock in the, in, in the farm. So a real cool step in the right direction, uh, enabling customers to come and buy uh, biodynamically grown uh, meat products. And even the whole store is filled with lots of other products that are all locally sourced and, you know, putting that buying conscious back into the power of the consumer of knowing where their product is coming from, the story behind it, and is it grown and, and harvested with the highest intention for nutrition and quality over quantity. Just absolutely beautiful. Master plan. That was incredible. That was like a, a real slap in the face. Seeing it, seeing it in action um, was, was the big turning point for me. Um, a quick background story. I, uh, my grandparents had a uh, merino property in East Gippsland, Victoria, and that's where I sort of formed my connection with the land. Um, we moved up to Sydney and um, we did high school in Sydney. After school, a bit of a free spirit, I thought I'd go out and do three years of Jack Brewing at Warren in New South Wales for each lab of Marino stuff, which was amazing, which was amazing. Um, came back with a head full of knowledge and, and I think maybe two or three dollars more than when I went out. Um, I then started my apprenticeship for Andrew, who's here, hands up Andrew, I'm going to embarrass you. Yeah, that, that uh, strapping young chap. Um, he had the fell, he had the fell like all my mates at the time, so did my apprenticeship there. Uh, which was amazing. Andrew said to me, uh, if you can last Christmas week, uh, I'll give you an apprenticeship. So I thought he was uh, desperate for a pretty good job. But the current industrial paradigm, essentially nature's the enemy. Now that's why the point of attacking the soil. This is a full page ad from a major rural weeklies across Australia uh, a few years ago for Roundup glyphosate. If you look at, and this, this is devised by top psychologists back in those days, Monsanto's offices, pressing the buttons of our psychology. Um, you look at the Roundup drum, the sexy face on. In the small print uh, is a line like, trust your killer instincts. So that's what we've been taught and are still taught. Next one, please. And as a result, I had to take over our farm uh, when I was 22, when the father had a heart attack. And I knew bugger all about managing the farm. I might have grown up there. So I sought the best advice, which was the top industrial farmers. And basically, I became illiterate with reading a living landscape. There was paradigm-induced blindness. And that, you can see that photo on the right of an overclear ridge. And bearing in mind that the ridges in Australia are usually recovered in uh, in eucalypts and other timber, it's where a lot of the water recharge occurred. We cleared them, the sheep camped up there, you had compacted soil, and away the water went and you got a row of gullets. And I've driven past that very landscape near Borobo. And I didn't realise at the time it should have been in hospital in intensive care. It was that good. That's how blind I was. Thanks. So <coughs> Having had to teach masters in the third years at uni, I had to dump my way through a lot of the work based on ecologists like Alan Savory and others. And really you can simplify how landscapes function and gain ecological literacy if you build it around five key landscape functions. Those weird species number five on the right, I've added that to the sort of traditional five. And all of these have interconnected indivisible, dynamically in feedbacks, and it's they that undergird, undergird our ecosystems and civilization. I mean, imagine where our fossil fuels come from. They come from the plants and photosynthesis originally. And I really want to particularly point out the indivisible two-way arrows between every single function there. 
Next one. So really, if you can't read that writing, it says the best things in life are free. So true. If you think about solar energy, which drives the whole system, and that rabbit is enjoying the fruits of it. Next one, please. So what, what are these practices going to do to ecological function and those key landscape functions? Uh, it certainly ain't going to help. I can see dust, the creation of the process of desertification beginning there. Next one. And that's what they've done, those practices. They've chopped that two-way interaction, that total interdependence between all those functions dynamically and feedback. Next. So I'll start first, I just want to illustrate the basis of some of these landscape functions before we move on to important issues like human health. So green plants are clearly the foundation, and I see myself as a landscape manager to stack on my land for as long as I can throughout the year those solar panels, the chloroplasts and those green plants that fix carbon out of the air and put it in the sh convert it into sugars to go into the soil to build long-lasting carbon or to feed the soil water or to grow from that. It's pretty much that simple. Getting those solar panels working for as long as you can. Next one. And one of the great examples is probably impacted, not probably it has, more hectares and the tens of millions now worldwide than any other regenerative practice. And that's the new regenerative grazing, whatever you want to call it, holistic grazing, regenerative grazing. And Alan Savory, um, my wife here, I've the privilege of staying with him in his ranch in Zimbabwe, but as it was then, uh, Rhodesia. He was a wildlife ranger in the 60s, and he asked himself the question when you still had those massive herds in their millions how come these are the healthiest grasslands on earth? And eventually, none of the doubts and apologies. You have huge animal density, a lot of dung and urine, and if it was compacted, the hooves would chip in the soil. But then, because of the big cat predators, they were constantly on the move. And they wouldn't come back for up to six months or more. So it was that animal impacts, disturbance, and then long, long rest periods that enabled the really valuable perennial grasses and the forbs and other species to be able to survive. Whereas under a lot of my early management and that one is pretty much the dominant form. The animals sit there all the time, the most valuable plants run out of energy because they graze so often. And this was a model that modified by humans to divide paddocks and, and the, follow that basic model is what is behind the whole regenerative agriculture and grazing approach. And there's some spectacular results. <coughs> you can see that. I'm privileged to go and visit Norman Croon, and it's in tough country in the Karoo region of South Africa. And in the 70s, he went out, and the farm he bought was like that desert landscape on the right. That was 200 years of Dutch and English overgrazing. Before that, it had rivers full of hippopotami, wonderful grasslands, and, and big migratory things. And he told me he had to walk a kilometre to find a perennial plant when he bought it. That's his country now on the left with holistic grazing. And within three decades or more, it more than triple its production. You can see how soft it is, the diversity of grasses and shrubs, etc. And huge resilience built into that landscape. And he's now running two or three times more animals when he's done. Sort of no-brain stuff, but it's a total paradigm shift. The poor hog and rice, the more they look at this planetary issue and the answer to say, we really only have one generation to turn this around before we could get on our events in some of those protective planet systems. And yet our leaders, etc., don't seem to be fighting on this. They're not looking long term uh, in, in this fight. But the movement is now grassroots, whether it's your buying the right food or regenerative landscape or the regenerative farms. That's what's exciting and it's growing. Next month. So we've got to phase out that 8,000 years of agricultural tradition. That photo on the left, by the way, was when I was climbing in the Himalayas in the late 70s. I, I met this character up in the foothills. He's carrying an exact replica of the first plough for the 
So we go aside and summarize the practices there. Vice on prayer, for mechanical and chemical intervention, and for Christ's intervention. We're going to turn our mask out to him. Next one. So I see our role as landscape managers to enable all these landscape functions to self organize and return to health. So it's self organizing capacity of complex systems is essential. Because this is the big engine that drives underpins and structures the functioning of all the natural world. We've just got to enable it. Next one. So, as I said, regenerate has profound solutions to challenging times. One, it's an agriculture that heals natural systems. Two, it has key solutions to the Anthropocene crisis. And three, key solutions to the human health crisis. Next one. Can we do it? Charles Darwin said it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It's the one that is most adaptable to change. But we're really going to have to get on with it. And I'll leave it there, and, and thank you very much for the Yeah, that was a little nice. Who's going to try and do drugs? This has got to be like a comedy duo or something. What is it? So I went to town, I did the course, it's a one day, and it changed my life because what it did was um, it made me question, the facilitator asked me questions I should have been asking myself 20 years ago. One of them was, are you happy? Right? And I said, well, I'm not happy. It's pretty shit to answer. Um, so, series of events, did some training, this one's here, uh, profiting from the drought and the growth of the profit. That's come up here. Um, anyway, the growth of the profit is a course that um, I did. And again, it was asking me to question my behaviour. It wasn't just my mind practice, it was about what I was, who I was in that context of landscape. Was I a manager? Was I a controller? Was I an enabler? Was I a healer? Was I just there trying to earn some money? And while I was there, you just using our resources basically. Because I thought they were there to be used. And what these series of courses did was change some paradigms. And paradigms are basically, you know, Typical example of a pattern of something, a pattern or model. It's a mindset and belief, and I needed to change them. And it took, it, it, took, it, it took a series of intense attention events and a long, a slow for that to happen. So, what have I learned on the way? Um, I'm trying to keep it brief. I learned that the first place you've got to change is not out in the paddock, not with. Cattle, sheep, fencing, water, wire. It's a paddock between the eggs. That's what we've got to change for. There are paradigms in there that I need to change. I mean, I had some paradigms blown away in the last couple of days. We did a natural super, we hosted a natural super farming course with Sue and Ben Andrews and had no last four days, finished yesterday, last night. <laughs> and like, it's really healthy to have your paradigms last week. That's the wide open. Get to see the island of landscape now, I'll think of you, Charles. Um, landscape literacy. Now, I'm, so, I, I, I'm looking through a completely different lens to the landscape. And this stuff is not just for farmers, right? I mean, if any of you can go to, to this course and have a bloody mind, because we all have seen farms, we've all seen hills, we've seen gullies, we've seen rivers in the room, you will not look at it the same way, I guarantee. And that's a really good thing. So, what have I learned? Soil is a great connector of lives, a source and destination of all. It is the healer and restorer and resurrector by the which disease passes in the health, age of the moon, death into life, without proper care for it, we can have no community, because without proper care for it, we can have no life. And that's, is that the rooster there? There he is. I learned, you know, the value of reading. I learned the, the value of opening my minds to other ideas. Not that everything in Charlie Hook and Unity, but the fact that within one, one, one version that I can, I can, I can give to other people, you know, it was like, okay, this is a collection of interviews from farmers that is compelling, not just for a farmer, to everyone. Um, which one? Landscape literacy. And then again, it's, 
It's a never ending, it's a never ending thing. Because once upon a time, as I said, all I looked at the landscape, it was a resource. There's gravel there, there's grass, there's water, I'm going to catch up the dam and you can stop. I'm going to plow that paddock and I'm going to grow some monoculture and make some money and sell it to someone like that. And I don't really care as long as it's reasonable quality and I can sell it. Five landscape functions, um, we won't go through them because Charlie already has. But that again was like, okay, so this landscape has five functions, that's cool. Because before, I didn't think about its functionality. Again, it was just a pile of resources I was going to use to make something, turn that into something to sell. Not thinking about how it was going to go back to the end. My only inputs were like chemical fertilizer. You know, I have that would, that would make up for it, that would be fine. I love my grass more than my livestock. Critical if you're a farmer, love your grass more than livestock. Because if you love your livestock more, you'll hang on to them, you'll flog your grass, you'll have no grass, you'll have to see your livestock. I used to love my life at war, and I used to send them all over the country on a gistment, and I'd feed them for days and months, and, you know, if anyone can tell me where the next drought's going to end, well, I don't care the next drought ends, but most farms do. But if you're going to feed stock, you want to know when the drought's going to finish. So if you love your grass more, you probably don't feed the stock anyway, like, by hand. You're just letting that grass grow, and then... Hello soil lovers, Regen Ray here again. Day two of my Sydney trip and I am just about to go and find the Scouts Hall down the road here uh, to hang out with Hamish McKay and uh, Charlie Arnott talking the, about biodynamics and the introduction to it, it all. And so while I feel like I know a lot about biodynamics, um, I think it's gonna be really interesting to get this kind of teaser uh, version of it and get you know some of the basics and the fundamentals so really excited to hang out in this room and just seeing the number of people that are already starting to arrive um, and get in the room it's really opening up to not just farmers but the consumers really being interested in knowing how their food's grown and uh, what questions to go in and ask shops and green grocers and butchers and so forth so that's been really interesting from the event that i attended last night and the event today those type of questions that are coming up in regards to where's my food coming from how is it grown um, and knowing the technical terms of it at all as well so uh, the power is really in the people at the moment and the consumers to dictate what food and quality is going to the supermarket chains and through the food processing kind of logistic system so power to you as the buyers and eaters of this food uh, until uh, yeah let's uh, jump into the room and hear some of the topics and the, they have to maintain this food for practices so that when white man um, asked for them, then they would be there to, to share. And if we actually keep calling things apart, this um, massive machine I've got in Switzerland, if we pull it all apart, we'll actually understand it. We'll know it. Yeah. And we're getting to a very interesting point where um, we're measuring more and more, and there's more and more questions coming up because things aren't happening logically. So good. So this is a sort of a bit of a cocktail, um, and I support this in, because um, my whole thinking is we've got to come up with a strategy that can cover the whole of Australia. And with the shortage of cow horns, we're, we're trying to use less of the horn manure and support it with the compost preparation. Yeah, so that's, that's the reason to do it. So we stir it until you can see the bottom of the bucket. Yeah, and then we reverse it. And you do that for an hour. And so one of my things is set it up so it's comfortable. Yeah, so you're standing, uh, if you've got mosquitoes, and you've got you know, something so the mosquitoes, because you're doing it in the afternoon after three o'clock. Yeah, um, and you can get the family involved, uh, whoever, and it becomes a really nice thing. And as Charlie often says, you don't have the radio blaring, all that sort of stuff. Well, I have to confess, um, I've got Vivaldi's Four Seasons on my phone, and that's roughly an hour. So I, I, I stand and listen to Vivaldi's Four Seasons as, as I'm stirring. But some people meditate, whatever. But try and keep your focus on what what you're trying to achieve in your in your space. 
Yeah. All the all the critters, the beans, the people are going to eat the food, um, whatever. So if you all like to just have a go, I oh, know I'll, then I'll just show you. Um, you get a dustpan brush, and you can get some twigs off a tree. Yeah. And I'll just walk out here because you'll see the sun. Mm-hmm. Don't disturb those golfers, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't need much. Yeah? We sort of aim for a drop per square foot. So what I suggest is everyone have a stir, and what I usually say is if you've got a wet hand, you can take a sample. Oh. Yeah. But the thing is, I really want you to be confident. Sometimes things look easy, and when you come to do them, it doesn't oh, yeah. So Hamish, I miss how much did you put into that? About twenty litres. Yeah. So, so that that will do at least two, maybe three lots of this. Yeah. So for the, for an average garden, that's that's a city garden. That's plenty. So as I say, if you like to um, have a stir, get a wet hand, take a sample, um, but you know, take it home to use it lots of this sort of. You can put it in a glass jar with a loose lid if you can't do it sort of straight away. Uh, uh, but, um, yeah. So, so yeah. Hamish, what, what is the significance the of way, the, What is the significance of the spin? Is it got something to do with the toroidal geometry, of the flow of the water? <coughs> yeah. There's a geometrical aspect here, isn't it? Yes, it's more than that. The, the plants. Oh, we can do that. Two days is. There's not enough time in two hours. The, plant, the plants come from the far end of the cosmos. Yeah? If you go to the far end of the cosmos, you end up with a plane. From a plane to a point is always a spiral. Sure. Yeah. So all life forms. So that's from, all stuff, so yeah. so all mm-hmm. life forms, um, umbilical cord with children, yeah, it's almost it all like comes down in a spiral. Yeah, it's our so yeah. we're actually we're mirroring that yeah. relationship yeah. to help yeah. the planetary cosmic influences come down in the, in the so sphere. almost increasing like the funneling yeah. aspect of the things that come out of the atmosphere into that structure yeah. and there's a guy called Christos Miliotis who did yeah. some research um, and using this preparation yeah go for it um, need a wet hand to pick that bag up he, he said that without stirring it he's still got some effect but not nearly the effect of stirring yeah and he said the main effect was on the taste he said when he Used this without stirring, and used it stirred. The taste of the tomatoes we research is significantly different. Okay. Yeah, so we're actually we're bringing down these cosmic forces. That's our ultimate measurement, isn't it? So that's the end result. That's our ultimate yeah. measurement. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. so what is it that's in that water and in with the the, the preparation at the moment? Well, that's got easily more... drawing in at the moment. But what is drawing in at the moment? Because um, my understanding is obviously the plants have their ability to draw in, but this is a bucket of water with stuff in it. So yeah. well, water is a carrier of life. Yeah. Oh, I didn't put that in. That physical, etheric, astral ego, I am. The carbon is the carrier of the physical. Yeah. Uh, oxygen is the carrier of the etheric. Um, nitrogen is the carrier of the astral. And <coughs> hydrogen is the carrier of the ego. Yeah? So there we get protein in those three elements. Could you just say that again? Please? Carbon is the physical. Yeah. Um, oxygen the etheric. Nitrogen is the astral. And hydrogen is the ion. The ego. <coughs> and that's what we call it. So, yes, it's bringing these elements together into... But into that bucket right now. Yes. <coughs> because we've created the Torah. The water is the carrier of the life. Yeah. <coughs> the water carries it, but is it also drawing it in at the moment? Yeah. 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 And it's drawing it in to these particular substances we, we're putting in there. Yeah. Via like a radiation, but like coming in, just <coughs> and then it's holding it as a vessel. Yeah. What it also does is the practice of, of, the, of, the, of the, the stirring and then backwards is, is it an opportunity for you to focus your intention on that water right. which you're then about to spread out there. So yeah. it's a it's a part of a ritual call whatever, whatever you want to, of the, the practice of I'm really putting some intention. This 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 liquid that I'm that I'm I'm stirring 
and, and having the background now that you have on that is <clears throat> reshaping that focus towards the intention is part of it. That's right. Yeah, I'm, I'm spreading this. It's just, it's just to produce food for my children. Yes. Right. Is there no better intention in life? Yeah. Um, it's going to go in my backyard. I'm going to sprinkle it out on the edge of my lawn for my, you know, my neighbours. Um, I'm going to. Alright. It's like the ritualistic value more than it is the scientific understanding. Um, yeah, I mean, people grab onto and, and, and you know, embrace different aspects of it. I mean, the healthiest way to embrace all of it. But if, if it's just a matter of just, I, I, I have the intention of using this to grow better food. Alright, so lovers, that concludes my trip to Sydney. I'm now back in the apartment here in Melbourne and it was really interesting to have some time to just reflect and um, uncompress some of the things that I've discovered uh, over the weekend. And I just wanted to share that, uh, you know, it's really now a great time to go out in the community and attend these events. Um, seeing the demand of people in suburbia and city uh, we were hanging out in Manly and seeing how many people were coming to the event to be consciously aware of the, where their food is coming from. Um, and kudos to the Fairlight Butcher who is stocking biodynamic m meat produce from Charlie Arnott's farm. Um, and it made me really think that, you know, the corner store that used to stock things for the community would respond to the demand. So if someone came in and said, do you sell a hammer? And then someone else came in and said, Did you, do you sell a hammer? The shop owner would go and stock hammers. And so it really is up to the consumers, us, people who are buying this produce to go into the shops and plant a seed of the type of quality food you want in there. And that's where that demand and supply comes from when it comes to marketing and also um, shop owners seeing the signals of delivering a product for their their community so i encourage everyone to go out into their local community and start asking deeper questions about where the food's coming from does the butcher know the farmer is it biodynamic is it organic is it grass fed or pasture fed or is it just grass finish like educate yourself to what all these different terms mean uh, and not, not just about meat it's about produce it's about food um, really support people who have got shops around the biodynamic space. Um, this weekend was probably the first time where I had a lot of pennies drop when it came to the biodynamic movement and really understanding. Spending yesterday with um, Hamish really made me, and this was like a really skim of the surface intro course, and I'm now really interested in going to the two-day workshop, but, um, you know, treating our internal organs like a muscle was a massive like mind-blowing uh penny drop moment for me uh you know we focus so much about training our outer body our limbs to become stronger but then we we feed our body and we make our organs process food that has been over processed and easy to digest and no wonder why our internal systems is getting weaker and weaker and so bringing back high quality nutrient dense food back into our body is a challenge for our body it's like we have to retrain our muscle internally to learn and how to process this food so I'm really excited about going deeper into this biodynamic world um, and uh, really encourage anyone to come along for the ride. So that's it from me for this weekend trip. If you've enjoyed this video, video which I hope you have, please like the video, subscribe to our YouTube channel because that really gives us feedback to what you're after and helps the algorithm share our video around. So smash the like button, um, subscribe, hit the bell, and uh, that will make us know that you're enjoying this content. And I'm really happy to be the bridge between some of the content that I go to. Obviously, it's too hard for me to share everything that I learn, but if there's just one little bite-sized gold nugget that I can share each time I go to these events, I, 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 I'm just gonna love continually making these videos. So support the channel, subscribe, hit the like button, um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I enjoy uh, cre creating this content for you. So until next time, keep digging deeper into your soils. I'm Regen Ray for Farming Secrets.